Would you pause with me for another moment of prayer as we ask the spirit of truth to take the word of truth and use it in our lives. Father, we do thank you for your spirit who inspired scripture. We understand that scripture finds its source in you and you alone. It's authoritative over the life of the believer, even unbelievers. As they're taught the word of God, the spirit comes with his power to convict and to exhort towards righteousness. Be our teacher, tutor us in your truth. Might we be yet again amazed at the beauty of Christ, the coming King, who those first crowds, the first followers totally missed. Make your word alive in our hearts as we comprehend its truth and be changed and be better worshipers and servants of yours through it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and join me in Mark chapter 11. I'd like to preach to you a sermon I've entitled, The Non-Triumphal Entry. We are tracing Mark's, Mark is the author of this uh, uh, book of scripture, this gospel account, this portrait of the life and ministry of Jesus, and he's very unlike what Matthew and Luke do to what's commonly been known as the triumphal entry. But in Mark's dramatic fashion, it is anything but a triumphal entry. So we come to chapter 11 of our verse-by-verse study of Mark's gospel. It's the beginning of Passion Week, which has often been commemorated by Palm Sunday, the week before Resurrection Sunday, or Easter It's inaugurated by what has often been called this event called the triumphal entry. Matter of fact, my preaching Bible, the New American Standard Bible here, uh, calls this text of verses 1 through 11 the triumphal entry. Yet Mark's presentation, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is not a triumphal entry at all. He doesn't enter on a white charger, He doesn't brandish a series of war trophies, and a train of captives does not trail behind him as any other king of his day would have had. In fact, within a week, the Roman guards will lead him out of the city as a defeated captive. Some king, huh? Jesus didn't hold his disciples' earthly fantasies of glory Because he's going to suffer and die for sinners. He's going to do as he said back in the previous chapter, chapter 10, verse 45. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Three times he prophesied, I'm going up to Jerusalem. We're all going up to Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. And it's not a good plan gone awry. The cross was never plan B. It was always the plan of God. Recently, someone commented that if if Jesus had preached the same message that many preachers preach in our day, he'd never have gotten to the cross. Never. It would have been the, the Jesus of everyone's imagination that we can all just sing Kumbaya together and get along. But he was crucified He did preach from his first sermon in Mark chapter 1, you need to repent and believe the gospel because the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not you're okay or let me motivate you and improve you to be a better you so that you can experience your best life today. He was indeed a king, but his crown would be a crown of thorns. He'd be enthroned on a cross and hailed as the chief of fools. This account in Mark 11 is the second time all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the same event. Previous time that all four Gospels are attesting to the same event was the feeding of the 5,000s. 
three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, deal with Jesus coming up to Jerusalem. John starts right away with the crowd coming out to meet Jesus with all their excitement and fanfare. Mark, thir Mark 11 begins with this unit of thought that extends through chapter 13, the theme of which is conflict with and rejection of the temple in Jerusalem. You see, they weren't just going up to Jerusalem in general. They were going up to the temple specifically. So this begins a whole section of thought, including all the religious system and the leadership that centered not just in Jerusalem, but in temple worship of their day. He rode into Jerusalem triumphantly in specific answer to prophecy as the coming son of David. And yet he's not received into the temple triumphantly. The indifference which will close today's text in verse 11, quickly turns to opposition. We only have to get to verse 28 in our studies in coming days to see the opposition. And then by the time we get to chapter 14 of Mark's gospel, it's eventually his condemnation to death. It's a week that begins on the 10th day of the first month in the Jewish calendar, the month Nisan in AD 30. It's Passover week. Entry on Monday, Passover would be on Friday, the 14th of the month. The rest of the book at this point, Mark slows down. Remember his famous, uh, his favorite word throughout the book? Um, his... Uh, his term, euthus, or immediately, event after event after event after event. Jesus is on the move. He's doing this. He's doing that. In Mark's uh, gospel, we learn more from what Jesus did than what he was taught. There's only a couple of times that you've got all these teaching, uh, got teaching segments. Jesus is still on the move, but there's only going to be a few more times in the Gospel of Mark of his use immediately. Now he expands the last week of Messiah. The rest of the Gospel of Mark it is just one week of time. Dear friends, I want you to revel in fulfilled prophecy as Jesus presents himself as the rightful Messiah, the rightful king. We'll see his entry, his approval, and his silence. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt there, excuse me, a colt tied there on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it and immediately he will send it back here. Notice the certainty with which Jesus dispatched his disciples. They went away, found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. Imagine just what Jesus said. Verse 7, they brought the colt to Jesus, put their coats on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. How underwhelming this account leaves us. Notice the, the entry. Messiah's entry, his arrival in Jerusalem and at the temple, verses 1 to 7. He's already ended his public ministry in Galilee and Perea. His death is just a few days away. 
The crowd of people with Jesus had grown after two startling events that took place around Jericho. You remember where we left in chapter 10? In, in Mark 10, 46 to 52, we've got the healing and salvation of two blind beggars. Then there's also the conversion of the hated and reviled tax collector Zacchaeus, according to Luke 19. So you add to the, the healing and salvation of two blind beggars, the, uh, the conversion of a despised tax collector Zacchaeus, and oh yeah, we've got the rising of Lazarus from the dead. All this hubbub, what on earth is going on, is what everyone's asking. So there's an excitement, there's an energy as they go up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. This is going to be a Passover unlike all the other years of Passover. Some suggest there may have been as many as 100,000 people in the triumphal entry procession. You know, these, these blind guys that got it, who had been sitting on the roadside for so long, they came to faith in Christ. They got saved and they got their sight and they joined Jesus on the way up to Jerusalem. How, how would you not do that? This is a man unlike any other man. We got to get some more of this. We don't know what to make of it. So upwards of 100,000 people on the way. Well, our story today begins with the eastern approach to Jerusalem as Jesus and his disciples come to the villages of Bethphage and Bethany. The order is a bit reversed as what you'd come to first physically, possibly Bethphage, the house of unripe fruit, because it was better known. But Bethany's the, the town where he was going to be staying while he's up in Jerusalem, just nearly two miles outside of town. Or to use the words of John, it's 15 furlong, furlongs out of Jerusalem is Bethany. Jesus arrives at these towns on Saturday, six days before Passover. And then the next day is Sunday. He attended a dinner in his honor at the home of Simon the leper in Bethany, according to Mark 26. So Saturday, Saturday they arrive in town right outside of Jerusalem. There is a supper in Jesus' honor on Sunday. And then the following day, Monday, he enters Jerusalem. You say, wait a minute. I've learned, I learned in Sunday school, I've learned, in, this has been the church tradition for years. We celebrate Palm Sunday, not Palm Monday. Well, I think that a chronology, as we try to put all the events together, the harmony of the Gospels, there's a problem if we've got Palm Sunday. Because if, if Jesus entered on Sunday, and that expedites things a day. We've got a silence of Wednesday. There is no way Jesus is sitting around twiddling his thumbs with his disciples. Let me give you another reason why I think that Monday is a better day for the approach. The law required that lambs be chosen on the 10th day of the month and then sacrificed on the 14th day. Keep your finger in our, in our study. Run back to Exodus with me, the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 12, because I want you to see this. Again, Scripture not only interprets itself, but it, it helps fill in these gaps as we try into, we're trying to apply a sanctified speculation as to the chronology of these events. How does the Scriptures direct the chronology? Exodus 20, uh, ex, did I say 20? 12. Exodus 12, beginning in the first verse. Exodus 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, think of this. So this is Passover week in Jesus' day, and they've been celebrating the Passover ever since these instruction times when they're in Egypt land, okay? So that needs to uh, rattle around in our thoughts here. He says in verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, 
They're each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So on Monday, for all these years, they've been bringing a lamb into the home, basically as a pet, to kill it on Passover. Run back to Mark 11, if you will. With our understanding, putting our, our Jewish sandals on through Exodus 12, in the year that our Lord was crucified, the 10th was on Monday of Passover week. So Jesus entered to the full role of the Father's chosen Lamb. You remember when Jesus came near where John the Baptist saw him in John 1, 29. John saw Jesus come into him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 36. And he took, looked at Jesus as he walked and said again, Behold, the Lamb of God. John couldn't get it out of his head. Jesus is walking like any other man and he recognizes this is the Lamb of God that's been slain since the foundation of the earth. It's always been God's plan. And to complete the parallel, Christ, the one true sacrifice that took away sin, when was he killed? Friday, the 14th day of Nisan, with thousands of other lambs whose blood could never take away sin, according to the writer of Hebrews chapter 10. So here we've got Palm Monday, and I know it monkeys with our traditions, but let's bring our traditions to study of Scripture and the accounting, the chronology. So here they are on the Mount of Olives, according to verse 1. That place rises over 26,000 feet above sea level, about 300 feet higher than Jerusalem itself was. So it's going to overshadow Jerusalem. Even before David's time, this had been a place of worship, 2 Samuel 15. At the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., Ezekiel had a vision of the glory of the Lord departing from Jerusalem in God's discipline and setting on the Mount of Olives, Ezekiel 11.23. So this Mount would have obscured the city from view. So on the way, they've been traveling. They get to the towns right outside, almost two miles outside of Jerusalem, and they still don't quite see the city. And he dispatches two disciples to go find a colt that's already been tied. Mark's vague about which village. Is it Bethany or is it Bethphage? Specifically, this would be a horse's foal. Matthew and John make that clear. You say, well, what's the difference? What's the significance in the detail? Well, I think every significance, because what we've got unfolding through the eyes of Mark is divine omniscience. This man, the God-man, as he walked in the flesh through the power of the Spirit, could do unlike any other man. The religious hypocrites that were opposing Jesus, he could put his finger on the issue of their heart and say, this is what you're uh, conspiring in your heart. For instance, in John, John 2.25, he, speaking of Jesus, did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. You know, and when we're working with man, doing discipleship counseling and stuff, we got to ask a lot of questions to kind of unpack the heart because we can't see one another's hearts. We make sinful assumptions many times. Jesus, the maker of man, could peer into their heart. Didn't need anyone to tell them what was in there. So as divine omniscience is playing out, even in what he's telling his disciples, to go find a colt that's tied and it's going to be a foal. 
I think divine foreknowledge fits the spirit of the story. We see Old Testament glimpses into the fact that such animals were regarded as specially suited for sacred purposes. No greater beast for the king, the Messiah, to be riding into Jerusalem, going to the temple than what had been used before. And verse 3's explanation would remove any objection that they might have had. Verse 4, they find it tied in exact fulfillment of Jesus' words. Think about, uh, put on their sandals for a moment. Think about what must have been going on as their jaws dropping like, oh, wow, he actually knew what he was telling us to do, even though he hadn't been there. The donkey colt, tied, none ever had sat upon, so it's untrained, unbroken, and the events all unfolding in detail as the omniscient Lord had said they would. These first six verses of our text are all preparatory, and they're so narrated to demonstrate Jesus' precise foreknowledge and omniscience, his sovereignty over subsequent events, so that it's going to be no surprise when you get to the cross and you see how that Jesus lays his life down. This is the sovereign king, only to take it up again a few days hence. Notice in verse 7, they brought the colt to Jesus, they put their coats on it, and he sat on it. What's the significance? So what? Who cares? Okay. Two books before you get to Matthew, back in the Old Testament, is the book of Zechariah. If you want to turn there with me. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, 9. Notice the prophecy that took place so many years before the event actually took place. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. An untrained, little donkey. So he commandeers a beast of burden, the prerogative of a king in ancient times. This too suggests Jesus' kingly role. You know, I, I mentioned just a moment ago the connection of sacredness with an unbroken beast. And so they, they put their cloaks on this beast for, so Jesus doesn't have to ride it bareback. He's not entering Jerusalem as some unknown victim, but with the same foreknowledge and sovereignty with which he's traveled on the way right along. This is nothing out of place. Nothing's going awry. With foreknowledge and authority and perfect knowledge, Messiah actively and deliberately rides into Jerusalem in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. He presents himself openly as fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy. But he's not on a war horse. You know, Houston, we got a problem with our nationalism. I thought Jesus was going to drive out the Romans for us. Like we had conceived. And yet he is meek and lowly, still with Mark's servant motif. I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. Previous chapter, verse 45. It's a hiddenness. A true messianic sign, though, the significance is not apprehended. It just went over their heads. It signified in his first coming that he wasn't coming to reign. He's coming to die. The crown of glory will only come after the crown of thorns. Riding on that meek donkey, colt, in contrast to the white horse when he comes the second time. He's not coming as the baby of Bethlehem when he comes again. He's coming as the conquering king of glory and every knee will bow that has not bowed up to that point. So he's coming not to reign, but to die. 
in fulfillment even of other Old Testament prophecies like what Daniel predicted centuries earlier. So we see hiddenness, we see smallness, and yet it is the real king, the rightful king, the Messiah of Israel. How about his approval? Verses 8 to 10. Where there's laud and honor. Notice how the, the, the people's response, this whole entourage, they're spreading their coats on the road. Others are spreading leafy branches which had been cut from the fields. Recognize the messianic entry. The crowd is eagerly entering into the spirit of the occasion. Let us get in on the excitement. This was an ancient practice in welcoming a new sovereign. 2 Kings 9, you see that when when Jehu... um, Well, we, we won't turn there today, but uh, 2 Kings 9 is one of those events where there's the coronation by coats being plastering the, the, the ground. When Mark refers to these branches gathered from the field, it's more appro- appropriately denoted a, a mass of straw and rushes or leaves that form this, this green carpet for the king. Matthew uses a different word a word that denotes branches from trees, and Luke, the historian, noted that they carried branches of what? Palm trees. Okay, so we get some of our tradition right, even though it might be a day later than we originally suspected, they are laying, some of them laying palm branches. Thus, the tradition of Palm Sunday before Easter. And what are they doing there? As they're doing that, they're shouting, Hosanna. A transliteration of the Aramaic form of the term that's found back in the Psalter. Back in Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26 is what's being alluded to here. Psalm 118, verse 25. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We've blessed you from the house of the Lord. They want salvation, but they want salvation of another sort. Not necessarily from sin, but from their sicknesses and the difficulties of life on planet Earth. As they're shouting Hosanna, the grammar of the text tells us in the imperfect in in the Greek that this cry is repeatedly heard. They keep on shouting out Hosanna, just like we were singing it in the hymn before the message. This particular psalm, Psalm 118, was used at Passover. It was a prayer for deliverance that would be rehearsed in song. So here, it's an appeal for divine help to bring about the expected messianic deliverance through Jesus. Like I said, it's not a pleading for salvation from sin, but more of just a blessing. Give us prosperity. Give us deliverance from Roman rule and oppression. They wanted the blessings of Messiah's reign that's not going to be delivered till he comes on that white stallion in the second coming. So we've got Psalm 118, 25, and 26. Part of the Hallel that was sung, especially at Passover. Here they're just echoing the shouts that they've done in years gone by, but specifically towards Jesus. This cry is recorded by all four Gospels. But when you compare what is being said, Mark's Expression here is the longest one. Blessed is the coming kingdom is the cry only found in Mark in connection with David. So this paraphrase of theirs is their own acknowledgement that Jesus is the fulfiller of prophecy. No longer was it postponed. It's actually in sight. This is the one that's going to drive out the Romans in their estimation. At the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, his first sermon that Mark records in Mark 1.15. He said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. 
repent and believe the gospel. Why were they to believe the message? Why was he saying what he said at the beginning of his public ministry? Because the king's present. And he's telling them at the beginning of his ministry, don't miss it. Because when you get towards the end of his ministry, you see that they missed it. This is too radical for many when he says to repent and believe. He says in Luke 9.23, If any man desires to come after me, let him what? Deny him safe, take up his cross and follow me. It's a narrow road. It's a constrained road where we don't just add Jesus to all of our stuff. It's the end of the line. To take up your cross means that you're going to die. No, you're not returning to life as usual. Later on in Luke, chapter 14, verse 28, he, he tells those would-be followers to count, count the cost. These are Jesus' terms for discipleship. So while they're shouting, Hosanna to the king, are you willing for this king to reign over you? We see Messiah's entry. We see Messiah's approval. And that leads us to our last verse. The anticlimax, Messiah's silence. Notice it again. Jesus entered Jerusalem. You know, all these 10 verses are just preparatory. So here he's finally getting into Jerusalem, comes to the temple. After looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with 12 since it was already late. Really? That's it? All the gospel is reaching this climax. We're on the way up to Jerusalem, up to the temple. You get there and you turn around and leave. All this royal procession and the buildup to come to this underwhelming conclusion to his first day in the holy city. In our English translation of the Bible, 10 verses setting us up. And here we've got an abbreviated full circle trip in one verse. He gets there and he goes back to the town outside of Jerusalem where he came from. The story's been building with a long trek on the way ever since Galilee, chapter 8, verse 29. Now he's ridden over from the Mount of Olives to the temple, the whole point of his destination. Not just Jerusalem in general, but the temple in particular. And it took just a moment for him to receive the messianic kingdom, but ironically, nothing happens. You know, and as I was reading this time and time again, just trying to see what, what, what are we not seeing here? You remember reading a, a great novel or watching a movie where the whole uh, uh, plot, the whole line is driving up. It thickens. There's been tension and twists and turns, and the, the enemy's just about to overwhelm the hero or the good people, and they light the fuse for the bomb that will decimate the bridge between them and the enemy. And it fizzles. That's exactly what's going on here. This is Mark's dramatic anticlimax, the non triumphal entry, if you will. All the clamoring crowds, they mysteriously disappear. In a complete anticlimax, Mark reports that the hour is late and Jesus departed with the twelve for Bethany. Matthew tells, told us in his account of the triumphal entry that uh, the whole city's a buzz. They're stirred to ask, who is this? Matthew 21.10. Who's this? Luke tells us the city was so electrified that the stones were ready to cry out. You could cut the drama with a knife. But Mark's report is noteworthy for what it did not happen. The whole scene comes to nothing. The crowd disperses as mysteriously as it had assembled. I think Mark's essential essentially warns here against mistaking enthusiasm for faith and popularity for discipleship. Just because everyone's in a buzz and on board doesn't mean that's the hand of God's blessing, that that's God's way. A 
arrival in Jerusalem at the temple didn't lead to pomp and circumstance, but only later at the cross, chapter 15. Jesus enters the temple alone, and he, he sizes it up in, in no time. After he looks around at everything, that's exclusive to Mark. Mark's the only one that gives us that detail. He did, gave a, a quick, exhaustive evaluation of temple worship, left nothing unobserved, had the right to inspect the conditions, even the unholy traffic therein, which is going to be crucial to what continues in the drama. And he leaves Bethany with his close followers and disciples. You know, this leads to Mark's first clue that the temple is not the habitation of God's Son. It's not. He is indeed king. He is Messiah, though veiled and unrecognized. In essence, this quote-unquote triumphal entry is a, a false coronation of the rightful king. The temple is filled with man's religion and apostate Judaism. The Judaism that God himself started when they were not a people, he made a people, he gave them the Mosaic law by those that approach me, I must be approached holy. He gives them the whole law where they'd been going up to temple worship in obedience to the Lord. But by Jesus' day, it was bankrupt. Even though he is Jesus is standing at the center of Israel's faith, he stands alone. Jesus took great pains to demonstrate his rightful office as king. He is indeed the son of David. He's fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. The whole crowd missed it. In the previous chapter, even a blind man saw it. And he began following him on the road. That's the very last verse of the previous chapter. Where he began following Jesus on the road. A blind beggar got it that cited people who observed all the deeds of Jesus who just went over their heads. The Apostle John informs that the crowd consisted of three different types of people. You've got the, uh, the pilgrim throng, John 12.12, 12, that approached Jerusalem from more distant areas, all the surrounding cities, probably most from Galilee where they'd witnessed, witnessed a large part of Jesus' ministry. It grew on the way. Then there's another group John tells us about in John 12, 17, the crowd that had been in Bethany when Lazarus was raised. Boy, if you can do that, we're going to follow you to see what else you got. Those who bore witness. And the third component of this crowd, according to John 12, 8, 18, is the large Jerusalem crowd that flocked out of the city to see the one who raised Lazarus. But none of them understood doesn't matter if there have been those that have been watching Jesus heal, watching Jesus give sight to the blind, filling stomachs, and actually producing food out of nothing on the fly to thousands of people. doesn't matter whether you've seen it or you just got in on it in Jerusalem. They all missed it. Yeah, they saw the political significance. Namely, deliverance from foreign oppression but they totally missed the spiritual requirements of his kingdom. There's no missing the borrowed and untrained full fulfillment of Zechariah 9, the spreading of garments. So no matter what the disciples thought and those with them, it was a coronation and homage to the rightful king of Israel, even though they didn't get it. They're callously unmoved. They're oblivious to its significance. And yet it's so real, demonstrated in real time, we ought to be more surprised that the Roman authorities don't take notice and crucify him early. It was clear and unambiguous what was going on. Unscrupulous false teachers of our day promise deluded followers that Jesus will make them rich. That he'll heal you. He'll fulfill your dreams. He'll grant all your desires so that when such selfish, man-centered promises fail to come to pass and trouble comes into their lives instead of blessing, many grow disillusioned and turn against Jesus. 
You know, they want another sign after sign after sign. What are you going to wow and dazzle us with next, Jesus? Whether it be the crowd of our day or the crowd of Jesus' day. Most don't want this benevolent king to rule over them. Thousands of people are quite willing to be saved by Christ, but when it comes to the very first step, namely that Jesus must be accepted as ruler and lawgiver and master and king and Lord, they start back and reject eternal life. Too high a cost, I'm not willing to pay. Just like the rich young ruler who went away sad. You must be either to let him reign over you or else you'll have to lie beneath his feet. And even though the whole crowd missed it, the redeemed acknowledged Jesus as their sovereign king, do we not? He's worthy of our complete submission and reverent worship. We enthrone Christ our king and our grateful, genuine homage and crown him as the old hymn says, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as we come afresh at the beginning of a new month, we want to again enthrone you in our hearts and our praises and our worship and our grateful service. Help us crown your Son, O oh Father, in our praises, in our affections, in greater love today than we had last week. Convict us from a Laodicean age where we are lukewarm. Help us to crown him in our obedience from hearts that have been subdued and wills that have been changed and conformed to his image. Exercise your kingly rule over our lips, the deeds of our hands, our eyes, what we look upon, and what's compelled from hearts that have been changed and set free. Might this be a beautiful journey in Jerusalem with our Savior as he grows more precious in our affection in the studies in the weeks ahead until we come to the cross and beyond. We'll be thankful for it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come at this time and hand out the elements if